Hello! So, let me just make sure everything is in order. Uh, let's see if I can get a little sound check in. Order. Uh, let's see if I can get a little sound check in. Okay, that sounds decent. Um, yes, hang on. Let's, uh, get this all sorted out first. Let me move the chat somewhere else. There we go. Activity feed. I'm rearranging the Twitch dashboard. I don't know why. <laughs> but, um, yes. Let's see. Let's get the chat up here. There we go. I think that's a lot better. Alright. Um, yeah. I think this stream is going nicely. No drop frames. All in the green. I ran like a speed test before we streamed. Um, yeah, like a couple of days ago, uh, the internet was pretty spotty over here. I don't know if that had, had anything to do with like the uh, Tal volcano eruptions. But yeah, to those, I mean, take care to everyone in the Philippines. And um, especially to those who are in the path, you know, or in the vicinity or the path of... Um. Uh, the the ash cloud from the eruption. So yeah, that's what's been going on for the past couple of days in the Philippines. Um, that's pretty much why I did not stream uh Monday morning. Like uh, we had a lot of stuff to take care of. Um, yeah, just to basically make sure that um, me and uh, my loved ones were safe. And I hope you and your loved ones are safe. Um, yeah. So we've got a few. This isn't exactly table talk. I know, like, uh, um, uh, based on the description of this video, like, it seems like table talk format. But we've just got a few announcements. Um, we haven't really covered, um, like, the, uh, sorry. We haven't really covered the local, um, local tabletop gaming news in a while. Even though we should have been, it's just been, yeah, really slow for the channel recently. So, hey, Santa Goy, welcome, good morning, it's good to see you. How are you? How are your, uh, how are your Western Marches style games going? Like, have those, have those, you know, um, have you launched that already? I think you have, right? Um, based on, like, a previous announcement I may have read. I think you've started your uh, your West Marches campaign. How is that going? Do let us know. I'm very curious, personally, about yeah how you're pulling that off. Hey, uh, Hermit Gamer. The Hermit Gamer. Thank you for tuning in. Good to see you again, too. Hope you guys are having a, uh, a nice, ash-free morning. And to my understanding, you guys are, both of you are in the Philippines, so I hope, like, you and your own are safe and have dealt with the ashfall, you know, relatively well. How have you guys been doing? And, like, in terms of tabletop RPGs, you know, like, how, yeah, what have you been up to? What have you been run have what have you been uh, running, been playing, been reading? Let's it's this is just hanging out, I guess. Um yeah. <laughs> I was planning on playing Disco Elysium, but I don't think I have enough time to get too many that many minutes in, you know? Like it might just be too short. But I don't know, we'll see. We've got some announcements to make, so you, uh, to make we've got some things to uh check out. Uh, I guess before, as I wanted to check out and um, talk about it before we got to that. Well, we'll see if there's time enough remaining. Very casual game, West Marches, so it's chill. Yeah, drop in, drop out. How many sessions deep into it are you? And, like, how has the format, you know, worked out for you so far? Are you liking it? Are you liking the whole like player schedule it uh the whole player initiative on where to go what to explore stuff like that and like how are you actually able to keep like the sessions 
you know, like tied up in a neat bow. Like you end the session, uh, you, you you neatly end sessions, you know, with players back in town without having to uh, schedule subsequent games with the same group, right? That's like one of a few of the tenets of West Marches. Um, how are things in Marikina? We're okay. Like there was Ashfall. I don't think it's as heavy as other areas in Metro Manila. I mean, I think Paranaque might have had it worst. Not sure. Um, but yeah, we're okay. Like, we're just a bit hesitant to open our windows fully because um, our house included, like the, the houses around here, still have ash on the, you know, the uh, on their roofs. So it's it, like, if the wind blows the wrong way, I'm kind of worried that the ash might um, come in through the windows. So there's that. Um, oh, only one session since you announced. Okay, yeah, well, hope you, hope you, um, hope you get to run more and, you know, keep me updated. Uh, The Hermit Gamer, good to know you're okay. As far as the and even part of an Eberron campaign, nice, nice. I'm not too familiar with, like, um, with Eberron. I think it came out, like, just after I got into... D and D, and like we had stopped buying books. My brothers had stopped buying books. Um, yeah, or like maybe they just they just weren't too interested in interested in Eberron. So I I never really got into it myself, but I know a lot of people are a huge fan of um, of the setting. So nice. It's good that like you guys you know you've got like a book out for it to support the Eberron campaigns. Um, and Eberron is, I think, now AL legal. Nice. Party's a bit dysfunctional, consisting of a gunslinger, an artificer, blood hunter, Goliath Paladin, Hexfeed Warlock. Ooh, journalists. <laughs> nice. That's cool. That seems cool. Like, I like that conceit that you're all, um... You're all employed by uh, by a newspaper. That seems fun. I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> um, yeah, Alabang and Espinas did get a lot, a lot of ash. Um, myself, like I've been getting back into D and D, or not getting back. Like this is like really my first serious uh like first big steps into dnd 5e i i got um like last year to cap off the end of the year i got the dnd essentials kit i got the dnd starter set i got i upgraded the hero tier on dnd beyond more on that later i got the player's handbook on dnd beyond which i now feel like it's a waste because um I feel like it's a waste because I didn't read the fine print. Apparently, only master tier D&D Beyond subscribers can share content. Um, it's really my bad. Like, um, I guess I'm a bit spoiled by JP sharing his content, you know, with me on D&D Beyond by default. Um, so I had planned to use D&D Beyond to provide, you know, the character creator and like uh, use like the Encounter builder and all that for my players. Um, unfortunately, yeah, they are not getting the options that they should be because I am just on hero tier and not master tier, which is super unfortunate. Um, and now I'm being, I'm, I'm getting tempted to just like go, you know, I got a tablet too over the holidays so I could more effect, not just D and D, you know, like more effectively um, go through large PDFs and even comic books. Uh, because I've been, I want to spend a lot less time at home anyway, like sitting at my computer. Like it'd be nice to be able to go around, you know, tablet in hand and uh, and read stuff. Um, that needs better business practices. Uh, why is that? Um, anyway, but yeah, like it'd be nice. So yeah, I got a tablet, and I'm fig. I figure like maybe I should go, you know, full on digital in some way and D&D Beyond seems like a one way to do that so I might subscribe to Master Tier 
if I can free up, you know, some recurring expenses, I might go that way. I don't know. Um, it just seems a lot. Well, yeah. Um, the here's the thing though, like um, you know, a lot like what Netflix did, like it just it made the price super competitive, and the added value of being able to have all your you know, all the shows in one place. Um, yeah, like, no, uh, to be fair though, yeah, like, um, it is a huge, you know, a huge temptation. And yeah, um, but let's not elaborate on that. Um, but that, that's true. In our part of the world, like, it's a huge temptation for us to, to get books through less than legal means, um, regardless of what, what your actual views on piracy are. Um, Right? Like, it's a thing. At least, it's culturally a thing. seems to be culturally a thing here in uh, Manila, if not around the whole world, because of how, you know, um, re the digital uh, release of digital copies just makes that easier. Let's face it. Um, but I feel like with D&D Beyond, with the character builder, um, no, no, seriously, like, it's, that line of thought is fine, like, let's just not elaborate on, like, where to get stuff, right? Um, let's not, the, that, that would be a way of promoting it, but, yeah, we're not endorsing exactly that, but I, I will say that it's a line of thought that is present, that, uh, a lot of people do think of, and the thing is, what I'm gonna say is that d, &D Beyond, um, because of the added value of, a character builder of content sharing even if it's like on the master tier so it's a bit what is it it's like um how much is it it's like six dollars i think six dollars per month so like 300 pesos um but yeah um so we've got the character builder the encounter builder soon uh based on the change log that they released like almost a week ago you know, uh, in time for the, like, right after the new year, there's going to be a player app. So, what does that mean? Like, players are going to be able to access the content shared by their DMs to them. I really like that, you know? I like that um, in a group, it doesn't even have to be the DM who has the Master Tier account. Anyone with a Master Tier account can um, join a campaign and enable campaign share, uh, content sharing there. So, you know, like, everybody can share in the content. Uh, even if it's a player who owns all the content and not the DM. Um, I kind of like the convenience of that. And it's really, like, with everything I've purchased so far, you know, like, it's, like the Essentials Kit came with, uh, aside from a huge discount to the player handbook, it came with a bunch of, like, a couple, a couple more adventures to get, you know, to continue from... Uh, where he left off in the in the box, so like it gets you all the way to level eleven. I kind of like that. I kind of like that the Sword Coast. I can now run like the Neverwinter area of the Sword Coast as like a little sa my own little sandbox uh, for new players. Um, it's it's really it's actually quite nice. I like it a lot. Um, so I'm considering yeah, getting on like. Fully on D and D Beyond, um, like part of it too. Like I like I love um, a lot of RPGs outside of D and D. Like my most recent one, my most recent favorite is Forbidden Lands. Before that was I would say uh, Star Wars: Edge of the Empire, Fate, Legend of the Five Rings. Um, all games I love. Tales from the Loop. Um, all games I love to run. Um, but I am kind of considering, I'm kind of considering, you know, going full on the Indie Beyond, seeing where that goes, right? Like, they are, they seem to have um, a roadmap for where they want to go that I kind of, I think you can Google this. Actually, let, I'll, I'll do it. Um, there's like an Asana. Uh, a Trello, rather, there. D&D Beyond feature features roadmap. Um, I'll put that up on preview shortly on the showcase. Here we go. 
So, yeah. Um, you know, they're gonna eventually have, like, uh, combat tracking, which is what I am... That doesn't seem... Um, too difficult to implement. I know other apps, you know, provide this. But, yeah. Dice roller integration... No, my campaign's page updates, so it'll be, I guess, a, a bit like Tavern Keeper. Stuff like that. But yeah, I, I had to look at this over the, you know, over the past couple of months. I like what I was seeing. Um, the... The, um... The stuff from the Essentials Kit kind of, I guess, pushed me over the edge. And here I am, contemplating going Master Tier in D&D Beyond. Because, let's face it, like, I do, I enjoy d and I enjoy running it. It is a very easy way, you know, to get people to, like, at least, I run into a lot of people who want to play RPGs, and the first thing that comes to mind is D&D. And this is, like, one easy way. Uh, D&D Beyond is just, like, another easy way for me to... to to streamline the process of putting together a campaign, um, helping them make characters, like the character builder is such a huge help uh, with regards to that, you know. Um, yeah, I guess really the main attraction for me really is the character builder and being able to share content on that with my players. So I may, you know, just go full D&D Beyond. I've been running a campaign, a, a new Fifth Ed campaign for some um, co-workers at my new office. Um, we're you know, we're we're using D and D Beyond. Um, it's yeah, quite a few of them are totally new, and mm -hmm. that's true. It's a mo it's a brand name with the most recall, uh, most um, uh, brand recall. So it's invariably what people um, find easiest to latch onto, right? Not to mention like the. Like, everyone's seen, you know, Lord of the Rings. Everyone everyone has a sense of what high fantasy is. Whether it's from video games or movies or TV series. So, it's like... It's one of the easier ways to get people into... Into, you know, tabletop RPGs. Um, I would say, like, Star Wars Edge of the Empire is a close second. Uh, especially if you're running the game for uh, players who have not played who don't have a background in D&D because um, otherwise they have quite a bit to unlearn when it comes to the dice system uh, but yeah and yeah rest in peace fantasy flight games that was some unfortunate news I, uh, we ran into let me catch up with the chat a bit um, at least D&D is in the spiciest Adobe that's true um, fantasy grounds is does have clunky UI that's what's like kind of keeping me from that's what kind of you know, I held back from that too. Uh, Unity version. Oh, are they coming out with one? Nice. Roll20 is great for games that don't need grids. Yeah. Yeah, like if you have... And if you want like a... You know, like a virtual table. Right? Like you can have like one PC, one computer, or one monitor uh, for the player account. At the table. If you have like a spare TV lying around. A spare. Um, yeah. Um, don't mind playing D&D. &D. Uh, DHG is more interested in the Savage Worlds engine. Deadlands. Or better yet. Porting Strahd to Savage Worlds. Yeah. Um, way back. Way back. I ran uh, Deadlands Reloaded for... You know, like my college gaming group. It is a lot of fun. We like the the you know the the card the hand of cards system was a pretty novel way of playing an RPG. We like that a lot. Um Interact yeah, they're in yeah, those divisions are what are shutting down. So I guess I guess that's it for a bunch of uh, I guess board games are still a thing. Right? For FFG. But they're RPGs and they're um they're 
games division, the ones that would make, you know, like the mobile versions of a lot of their popular board games, I guess that is out. Yeah, yeah. Their LCGs are still alive and well. LCGs and board games, yeah. It's just RPGs and um, the digital gaming stuff that are getting shut down. Heard good things about the Marvel one, too. Um, a friend, I think, posted like uh, some of the Marvel stuff over the holidays. He said it was, you know, it seemed, it was easy. Um, like, easy to play. Like, it's not as hardcore as a lot of minis games, but like all, it's still um, enjoyable and like really fits the theme uh, for each character, supposedly. Yeah, but I wouldn't expect like them to come out with more content for Genesis. I think like this is like, you know, up like that would be super optimistic. Um but yeah, that's it. Like I guess Genesis does have like an OGL thing, so people will still make could like um passionate fans could still make Genesis content and sell it on drive through or other, you know, other avenues. Um but yeah, like I think official FFG Genesis stuff is gonna be, it's gonna be, yeah, not a thing anymore. Easy to play, but ask your friend to play against Ultron in hard mode. <laughs> Fitting, yeah, like I guess that'd be, um, appropriately difficult. It should be. Ooh, CCL, which is more restrictive. Interesting. Um,. I'll look into that. I'm curious about that. The difference between OGL and CCL. Anyway, um, a couple of things uh, that I want to bring up. So, uh, there is a local game designer, uh, Dewata ng Manila. And there has been a call out um, to help her. Essentially, yeah, like, um, she's hit a rough patch. Um, uh, been struggling to pay off her rent, her backlog rent for a while now. Uh, there has been a lot of personal stuff that occurred in the last year that ended up accumulating a massive amount of, uh, you know, debt between them and their landlord. So they're trying their very best, uh, you know, to stay in the creative field, to keep uh, working as creatives, and more importantly, the local scene as local RPG, you know, makers, designers, and layout artists. Um, yeah, but there's still a lot of ways to go. So, you know, like, uh, paying this off will make sure that Sin and the pets in uh, their care, they aren't in any danger of being evicted. Um, and uh, there's uh, this is a game designer with uh, lots of goals for 2020. Like, she's already very prolific in either helping out or creating her own games locally. Uh, one of her goals is to uh, make it to Big Bad Con 2020, which is turning out to be like a great place for... Uh, designers in our area in the southeast asia um area you know it's a great platform for us to be visible uh just like for um uh pam and mahar last year like who got to rep us at uh big bad con so yeah um for those of you who do watch this uh this this stream in time to make it because there's still like one month a month to go uh on this offer um, yeah, uh, you can purchase it at the $10 minimum or you can add more if you like. But basically, um, there's a bunch of support, out, an outpouring of support for Sin from a lot of people. Not just uh, locally here in Manila, not just game designers here in Manila, but also in South Southeast Asia. And also game designers who, you know, who are aware of our uh, RPG creators Um who are based in, uh, no, a lot of people based in the U.S. and other countries, who are aware and of who are aware of and support our local creators. So there's a long list of people here who have contributed, you know, their work uh, to this bundle. Essentially, um, the total worth is around 300 U.S. dollars, and the minimum price is just 10 U.S. dollars. So, um, yeah, uh, this would be. This would be a huge, a huge help to um, to Sin. So here's a bit of a preview of what you can you can check this out. I'm gonna put the link up 
in um, in Twitch chat. Oh, is it not just chatting? I think yeah, I've got just chatting up on my dashboard. But thank you for um, thank you for the heads up. But yeah, like I'm looking at my dashboard right now, and it is set to just chatting. Um, but yeah, thanks. Um, where was I? Yeah, so a bunch of it says Disco Elysium. Okay, it just changed now. Yeah, I double click. I clicked on done again just to make sure it's stuck. I guess I forgot to hit done. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the heads up. Um, where were we? Yeah, a bunch of games here. A bunch of games here. So you can check out the link to see um, what you would be getting for just 10 bucks minimum. Um, Santa Goy says... Yeah, no. Um, you know, like, if you can't... If you can't afford to give, you know, just yet, that's fine. Um, I can't either just yet. I'm waiting for another, you know, another, my second influx of money for the month. Um, but yeah, perhaps January 31. Perhaps you could both, um, you could both pitch in then. Um, but yeah, bookmark, bookmark the link. You know, it's, uh, itch .itch .io. Um, well, it's too long to be handy, but you can check out the link. It's there in chat. Uh, feel free to bookmark it if you do plan on uh, supporting uh, Sin um, in the future. But, and you're just waiting for funds to come in. Let's see. What else? What else? So yeah, like, speaking of like being into D&D recently, um, I think I've run into a bit of a unique problem in the way I DM stuff. Like... I don't know why. I, I I'm not sure exactly why, but I'm having the hardest time running Theater of the Mind Combat in D and D five E. I'm discovering. I don't know why. I don't have this problem with other games that don't you know, that don't have the option for grid combat even. Like I can run Theater of the Mind Combat in Alpha in um in Forbidden Lands, I can I can run it in uh, Edge of the Empire, all pretty easily. But for some reason, I don't know. Like that part of my brain shuts off in D and D Five E. Maybe because I know there's like a option to just run it on a grid and let the players have at it. But you know there are a lot of benefits to running Theater of the Mind Combat, um, being that you can run things at a faster pace than uh, grid. Um, there is, um, you can, like, inject a lot more narrative flavor into Theater of the Mind Combat, um, than 5e. You can be more flexible with movement in Theater of the Mind Combat than in 5e. Because, like, it's kind of boring to tell a player that, um, no, like, a double move won't quite get you there, and you're, you're doing nothing this round but move. Or, you know, there could, there could be, that, that could be a nice, you know, point of tension. To me, like more often than not, that's a bit of a boring way to. That's a wasted act. That's a wasted turn for a player. Um, I yeah, I think it's just that I tend to when I run theater of the mind, like uh, it defaults to having like some kind of mental grid, and so it slows me down. Right, it slows me down. It it kind of I have I just have difficult difficulty switching gears. When it comes to D&D 5e, I will say that it's not D&D doesn't. It's not that D&D doesn't support theater of the mind. You know, it it does. It's like you compare it to 4e. 4e grid was mandatory. That whether it's a digital grid or you know like an actual, an actual, um, an actual uh, what, like tabletop ac accessory. Um, like I I would argue even for 4e that like. Uh, power cards were almost mandatory also. Um, for 5e, not so much. You can run 5e fine in Theater of the Mind. Um, I've watched videos. I've wa I've played uh, through, you know, people running 5e with Theater of the Mind uh, in combat, 5e combat uh, via Theater of the Mind. 
Um, but yeah, um, I don't think it's not supported by 5e. I think it's, you know, like it's just, it just happens. I, I just have run into a rough patch. So yeah, like what goes to my brain, um, yeah, like maybe I'm trying to still visualize things as a grid. Uh, maybe um, I'm having trouble making things, uh, you know, like making things varied and exciting, you know, every, every, every turn for the players. Um, I actually just like, I, I did, you know, I did a quick search for like how to do theater of the mind combat, found this article on D&D &D Beyond. Um, I think it's, I think one of the things, the, the, its very first point, you know, uh, which is to establish trust that um, a trust that the DM is that you as the DM you're not competing against them, um, like freeze it up, freeze players up to be more inventive and not like hold their cards too close to their chest in terms of what they want to do in combat. Um, it's, uh, yeah. That's I think that's a that's a huge point. I think um, in that same sense, like with Theater of the Mind, like you have to telegraph to the players a lot. Like during the monsters' turns, like what the monsters doing and what might what they might do next turn. Like I know this from running, you know, from having run games like Fate before, games like uh, Part by the Apocalypse games, you know, um, Forged by the Dark games, where you you're, you are supposed to kind of. Uh, give the players something to react to before before a player's turn starts. I know that from other games, but some for some reason, like I've kind of, you know, let it all, you know, like kind of blocked it off when I'm when running D and D five e. So it's something like th this is something that I have to relearn again. Um, for th for this game, I feel like you know, like have it make sense in. Just re and remind myself whenever I, whenever I run combat that I have to, um, if I expect the players to not, uh, you know, keep their plans close to their chest, I should also do the same thing for them by kind of telegraphing, um, monster actions like enemy actions in advance, like at the end of an enemy's turn, right? Like, so let's say the null, uh, like the or the the bugbear makes its two attacks. Makes an attack against the players and misses, like, and then telegraph like before end of Bugbear's turn. Like, what's it about to do next turn? Is it about to run? Is it about to, you know, um, is it about to try and like grapple the character who's now, um, within within reach of it, um, stuff like that, stuff like that, like to give players something to react to on their turn, like knowing that if they don't deal with this monster now, you know, um. Like, that's that's what's gonna happen. Like after their turn, after after the player turn, when the monster's back, um, when it's a monster's turn again uh, on on initiative, in the initiative order rather. Um, but yeah, like and that, yeah, remind the player, show the players that they can do more, um, help the players realize that they can do more with theater of the mind combat than on a grid. Uh, that that helps too. Focus on intent. Okay, wait. Let's catch up with the chat. Uh, Santa Goy loves 13th age. Is and the 13th age is better with Theater of the Mind Combat. I've yet I haven't checked out 13th age yet. Maybe I will just to to see how it handles stuff like that. Uh, that kind that mode of play. There might be some nice tips there. Um, blah, 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 blah. The grid from a design standpoint bottlenecks imagination unless you have a very good. I feel like, you know, like uh, I don't feel like that. I don't feel that way. Uh, pretty much, um, when I do a grid, it's really just to help. It's it's just like. It's just like if there were no grid and you wanted to draw, like you know, to draw, the base the a basic representation of the space, and like for. Like, even if you weren't using miniatures, like, you were just, like, doing X's and O's, like, to show the players where ev where everything is at. You know, I don't think it caps people's imaginations at the table. That's, like, 
um uh that's a bit for me that's a bit of a blanket statement like some people may have trouble imagining stuff with a grid or you know with like a with like a visual representation instead of like it being fully in their heads but for some people like um me myself i like being able to make sense of a space um and what i'll do sometimes is talk about zones right just basically divide divide the space into zones of um like an, a close zone like where you can uh you, okay like you can get to any part of this zone on your move and you'll still have an action and then like a far zone where you'll have to take two move actions to get the, uh you know the or rather your movement and then a dash action to get there um yeah that's how i tend to group stuff like when i do theater of the mind uh in dnd 5e um if i'm not using like yeah if i'm not using a grid um range bands uh so a grid is more a simulation thing, thing than being involved that's yeah there's a good point to that like you do want to kind of simulate you know wargaming tactical movement um it can still be evocative though like yeah like i try to um you know as long as you're descriptive and not being just like okay you move 30 feet that way uh, i feel like it, it can still be evocative you can still describe like how they um it's really and how you lay out the space right like if you put obstacles difficult terrain uh if you pepper if you pepper the if you pepper uh the area that you're representing with stuff like that stuff for players to interact with um you know even just columns you know like that can provide half cover um do work uh if there's like a a curtain that can provide concealment it's uh i don't know like it's really it's really up to like how you put the space together what i like to do i like to even like let players say that oh there's a table there you know like if it's blank if i haven't like set it up beforehand i'll let players like call out the like on a grid um just like in like how they might be able to in theater of the mind oh there's a table there and can i turn it over and i would get half you know half cover or three fourths cover from that something like that like i'll let players um i try to encourage players to do that um yeah so yeah to your to the hermit gamers point like it would i guess it would help to have like a basic diagram unfortunately i don't have like a um the only thing that works with I have that works with dry erase markers, with my dry erase markers are a um, are it's it's like the you know the official you know like grid <laughs> for D and D. So it's by default I have something like the only thing I can use dry erase markers with is a grid it has a grid on it. So for better or for worse. Um, yeah, action based. Uh, yeah, Colville does have a lot of great tips. Like, I feel like I should revisit those videos. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, range band. Um, for me, range bands have. Yeah, I, I I appreciate what range bands try to do. Like, in a lot of cases, it can feel like in Edge of the Empire, range bands. I don't like it there because it doesn't make a lot of sense when you're trying to do things. Um, uh, you know, when you then move. From range bands into like the like if, if like an edge of the empire if you move from pure theater of the mind and range bands if you move it to some kind of graphical representation it gets a bit finicky um yeah but in dnd yeah so my my range bands in dnd are essentially adjacent adjacent uh within within a move and needing a dash that's as far as I take it to the, with, with D and D. Right. Um. I think you're talking about the uh, Matt Mercer giving, gob a uh, Matt Mercer Matt Colville giving goblins, or giving like fifth edition monsters, um, like villain actions. Uh, because there there are fifth edition monsters with legendary actions, but they're usually only like you know the special uh, high level high CR monsters. 
um, what that video I know the video you're referencing it's where he adds like a bunch of um, like villain villain boss actions or um, villain boss actions or uh, what do you call this or solo monster actions that kind of help you add a bit add an element of you know um dynamism to, to combat to make combat with even like non legendary level monsters a bit more special so yeah okay um i gotta take a call real quick i will be right back and you know leave you uh enjoying some zelda some zelda music i'll be right back So anyway, yeah, like, uh, thank you for waiting. I'm back. Um, what do you call this? So yeah, that's just a bit of, like, a few things I'm trying to tackle with, like, the edge of the mind. Like, keeping things interesting. Um, like, you know, I'm able to, tra to track the basic stuff. Like, who is engaged with who. Who is, um, who is engaged with who in melee combat. Who is targeting who. Whose turn it is. Like, the general positions of people. It's just, it's, it's. It it just it just lacks spice like when I do it in D and D five e and it's I think because I'm still like thinking of things mentally you know as being on a grid as being um, as being um, uh, like not yeah not as dynamic that's true you know like not as dynamic as uh, theater, theater of the mind can be who is engaged with whom thank you um, yeah um, but. I think, yeah, if I focus on, um, uh, what do you call this? Yeah, there's a lot of good tips here. Like, yeah, um, trust, focus on intent, like what the players want to do, not what actions they want to take, you know? Um, starting small, what does that mean? Oh, okay, like basically training players in theater of the mind combat. Describing the situation each turn. So like a, I guess a summary. Like a, a, like every at the start of each player's turn. That seems a bit much. It would bog things down. Maybe at the top of the initiative order, like that might, like if not, um, describing the intent of what monsters are about to do at the end of a monster's turn. Maybe this would be a good place to put it. Like when you go back to initiative slot one, then you kind of broadcast. Right? Like what the monsters are about to do uh, this turn. I think that's like one way I can definitely like keep things dynamic. And, uh, you know, like keep the tempo up. Keep the excitement up. Um, fall back to quick diagrams. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Like I said, the only thing I can really draw on that's easily erasable is like a, a gridded, you know, dry erase board anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, erase of effect. I like the one in the DMG where, like, um, depending on the amount of the size of the area of effect, like the number of creatures of different sizes, you can, um, you can damage. Let me see if I can find that for you guys. Uh, so I can show it on stream. Uh, sources. DMG. 
Running the game. Where is that? Where is that? There we go. Targets and area of effect. Like, um... So, yeah, this one. So... I hope that's visible on stream. Not too difficult to see. Um, so, what I like about this is that, like, if there's a cone... Um, you don't have to, when you're running Theater of the Mind, you don't have to, like, you have a way of basically telling players, like, oh, this is the, th these are the number. Th this is who you can hit, like, without falling back on, like, putting things up on the grid. Um, so, yeah. So, educating areas of effect. Many spells and other game features create areas of effect, such as the cone and the sphere. If you're not using miniatures or another visual aid, it can sometimes be difficult to determine um, who is in an area of effect and who isn't. Uh, the easiest way to address such uncertainty is to go with your gut and make a call. But if you'd like more guidance, using the targets in areas of effect table um, helps you imagine... like. Uh, or helps you have a system, right? So imagine which combatants are near one another and let the table guide you in determining the number of those combatants that are caught in an area of effect. So add or subtract targets based on how bunched up the potential targets are. So consider rolling 1d3 to determine the amount to add or subtract. So, um, yeah, so for example, like for a cone, it's size divided by 10 and round up. Um, like, a 15 foot cone for burning hands uh, would use a table and you could say that 15 divided by 10 that's 1.5 right round up to two so that's two orcs or a lightning bolt uh length the, the the tip here is length divided by 30 rounded up so lightning bolt which is a 100 foot line um you could say that uh 100 divided by 30 that's uh 3.3 bar rounded up to four that's the number of um of ogres or, gob or of targets you can hit, you know, like just a generalization. If you need, um, if you need help with that, uh, yeah. So the idea is simplicity instead of spatial precision. Um, yeah. So have a quick recap of what each player is doing with nouns. Yep. Having a recap, uh, yeah, describing the situation each turn. That's that was in this article too. So recap of what the players are doing each turn. Also, uh, like I've been saying, I want to be able to provide, um, like, uh, to telegraph, like the intent of each enemy at the start of each turn. Like if if I'm if I'm gonna do this uh, for players, I'm gonna do this uh, to help them out. I'm gonna describe also like what each enemy is doing. Um, in, or rather intends to do at the start of each turn. I've been doing this, identifying monsters with, uh, <laughs> with, um, with physical traits or clothing. Like, uh, I think my players went up against three bugbears and, like, right off the top of my head, I went with, you know, like a bugbear with, like, a prodigious schnoz um and like we started calling him like um kylo ren the kylo ren of bugbears uh then one had the, the second bugbear like had lots of piercings um and what is the third one the third one was uh tusks quick and easy that was a fun combat but yeah so like uh evocative in story descriptions I tend to be a bit free wheeling with this. Like, I'll let the players do this themselves. Like, it's a bit of, you know, like, Matt Mercer's, like, how do you want to do this? But, you know, I ask the players, like, even if it doesn't take out a combatant, like, if they do uh, some significant, a significant hit or bloody the, um, bloody their opponent, right? Um, meaning reduce them to, like, half or less than half their hit point total. I'll ask them, like, what, is, what does this look like? Um... Or yeah, any any time I like want to give the players a moment of cool, moment of awesome. Um, yeah. 
I think this is something I want to do more often, like roll to see which players get targeted. I'll try this out. Roll on the on the behalf of the monsters, like, okay, who is this? If there's no clear target, right, or no clear tactics, like, uh, you know, like, gang rush the mage, or something like that. Um, I'll probably, I'll probably uh, think of rolling. Right now, the group only has one tank, which is like very unfair, I think to the lone fighter of the group. Um, yeah, I don't think I wanna... Like, you know, usually the mons the clear indicator for who to fight first for a lot... Or who to take out first for a lot of monsters or enemies is the person with the, you know, the most hit points, the buffest one. Yeah, um, each... I think each uh, entry on the monster manual d d tends to come with... Uh, tactics. Um, I I do like I do sometimes consider that, but I also try to consider like um, like what the monsters' objectives are for a certain situation. So yeah, like if they know in advance, if they if they've heard like um, uh, if they've encountered the party before, for example, and they know that this dude. Um, this spellcaster is going to fuck them up if they don't take him out first. Regardless of the fighter, you know, charging them down presently. I would say that they might ignore. They might ignore the fighter in favor. Or like have, you know, give the fighter like to a token person to, um, to, to go up against. If only to have them stuck there and think about incurring... Uh, Opportunity attacks if they decide to defend the mage, but yeah, like um, they might gang rush like the wizard who or sorcerer who fried who's fried their um, who's fried uh, yeah, previous batches of monsters. What else? Yeah. Um, let's have a quick look at like what is going on uh, locally, right? Like what so what gamers can look forward to this coming week. I might go here. So this is a uh, this is keep rolling uh, a gamers and GMs event. It's gonna be at Venture Space. Venture Space. Uh, Along Shaw Boulevard, close to Edsa, um, that's on the side of Star Mall, the southbound side. Um, yeah, so the they are celebrating the New Year, and check the Discord. What's going on in Discord? <laughs> okay, I'll put that up in a bit. Um, so their uh, gamers and GMs are inviting everyone to celebrate the New Year, and uh, by you know. Getting trying out some cool new games and adventure modules, some by local creators, some uh, some not. And there's also, you know, uh, I think D and D here, like Eberron. I might finally try AL, like if I can, uh, if I can, if it's not too difficult to show up and walk in, I might try my hand at some AL. Finally, um, at this event, so yeah. There are uh, who's running Mothership? I forget, but yeah, like I was thinking, of, I was thinking of trying Mothership too. But uh, I don't know. I am. I know it sounds like I know I'm usually like the one who advocate who advocates for trying everything not D and D, but I, I am. I want to try D and D out. I want to give it an honest shot. I, and part of it is I want to. I want to be exposed to other DMs who run D&D. Kind of, you know, pick up some lessons here and there. Um, for example, in my homebrew, in the homebrew campaign, I'm running for um, for my office mates. Like I've been trying to, uh, I guess, um, try out some rules that I feel uh, are more fun for like how I like to run D&D and stuff. Like, uh, I have a house rule for critical hits where they always do the maximum damage they normally would for an attack and then roll the bonus dice. 
So it's always at least full damage on a critical hit. So critical hits are very powerful, I guess, in my game. Uh, which makes rogues kind of OP. Um, perhaps. Um, what other house rules do I have? Uh, I was trying to do like a 2d10 on ability checks thing to see how that would impact, you know, like uh, having skills, like what it makes skills and abilities, uh, ability checks like more reliable for players as opposed to having like a flat uh, d20 roll without a bell curve. Um, because like on 2d10, like the most common rolls you're going to get are, I think, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um... So and you're you're gonna get rarely a two, and rarely a twenty. So it's um. So it's uh. I thought that did have a bit of an impact on the game, um. But yeah, like it's it just I don't think it worked out like I wanted it to. So I'm just back to using like a d20 roll for ability checks and skill checks. Um, what else? There, oh, I do max HP until level three, so players will be getting their max HP until they get to third level, and then, um, and then they start rolling for HP. Um, tried Fantasy Age. See, oh, that's yeah, that's a yeah, that's a nice. Um, uh, I guess the bell curve would be more pronounced because you have more dice. Um, what I was drawing on. Was the stars without number engine? So they use a two d six for skill check for skill checks there. Um, but yeah, I think uh, yeah again the bell curve there is more pronounced because it's just d sixes um, that you're working with. So it's steeper into the middle, right? To the middle results as opposed to like. Having uh, 2d10s, which I think resulted in just like a slightly higher chance, um, very slightly, uh, very, very, just slightly higher uh, chance of getting the middle numbers. Um, so the 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 impact is almost imperceptible. So yeah, I've I've, I've just decided to ditch that house rule. Um, what else do I do? What other what other you know what let's open is it dice.org did i get the right website no 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 is it random.org uh, dice Any dice. Was it any dice? Yeah, I think it was it. There we go. So, okay. So, there you go. Output for 3d6. That's the bell curve. Um, you have a 12.5% of getting uh, a 10 or 11. And, you know, less than 1% chance. Less than um, 0.5. Then half a percent of getting a 3 and an 18. Right? So what I was doing is uh, 2d10. You can see like how much gentler the bell curve is for 2d10. So you get... Um, yeah. You get 11s. Uh, yeah, the highest ones are 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, I guess. Where you have an 8% chance to 10% chance of getting um of hitting the middle it just didn't feel that tangible to me and it just felt like uh, a hassle every time i'd explain that you need to roll 2d10 instead of 1d20 um yeah 1d8 plus 1d12 i wonder how that looks oh that's a flat Oh, no, 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 that not be 20. 1d12. One 1d8 one plus 1d12, like, gets you a flatter bell curve towards the middle, interestingly enough. So 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 
um, instead of still having a curve here, like you get a really flat response of just 8.3 percent across those uh, those five middle numbers: 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. So yeah, yay dice math! Like dice math is fun. <laughs> So if you wanted, like, what I was going for, essentially, is that skills would be more reliable, right? Um, skills and ability checks would be more reliable than the chaos that is combat and saving throws. So if you're trying to, you know, um, perform a skill check, like, to pick a lock, to, to, uh, to, um, pick a lock, to... Like, you know, bend bars, you know, whatever. Um, you could kind of depend on your um, ability, on your modifier, your bonus modifiers, uh, a lot more than you would on a d20. Because, yeah. Because on a 1d20 roll, like, it's fair game. So, like, the only thing that's changing that's... Um, Affecting your chances really are um, are your uh, your modifier, right? So yeah, it's a flat five percent chance for any number. So what you do is like, for example, if you're if you have to hit a TN a DC ten, and you have a plus five modifier, so you, all you have to roll. Is a five or higher, you're doing that. What? That's a eighty percent chance, right? You just subtract the rest of this from one hundred percent. But if you have the bell curve, like you'd more reliably, let's say for higher DCs, like for DC fifteen, um, or a DC eighteen, right? Um, it just makes um, it makes it. Uh, the chances of getting like the middle results are higher, so it makes it a bit more, um, makes things a bit more grounded in like what your modifiers can actually do for for your character and for your chances of su of success. Uh, anyway, yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, um, hopefully I will be able to make it to this event. Um, keep rolling 2020 uh especially if i get a good night's sleep before i might just you know pass by uh to hang out say hi uh hopefully like watch if i can't get in on any games like maybe i would love to see if i could like sit at the uh alien uh the table that's running alien just to see how that goes or even mothership or troika uh some games I've, i'm interested in seeing like how they play um yeah that is that is that okay so um i'll leave it there uh we ha we didn't have time to i guess launch into uh to launch into playing disco elysium sorry about that but one last announcement before we go uh, that i would like to make is that Um, any modifiers in those three D sixes can make an impact. Yeah, that's true. Like the modifiers will make a pretty big impact. What I do like with having a bell curve, though, is that like um, you know, like just like when you're playing Catan, you know that getting the middle results, right? Um, the six, seven, and eight, uh, is you can kind of rely on that, and you know that um, getting twos, like the the results towards the edge. Uh, those are outliers. Um, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Like, one, the last announcement that I do want to make is that uh, for the month of January, um, this is going to be, this will, this will be essentially the last month that DiceCast is going to be operating. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit of, you know, bittersweet news. Um, we've, realized that the uh even for our modest you know like streaming schedule uh it's hard to keep up 
with like just me and JP. And there have been a lot of you know life changes for the various members of the Dice Cast crew, from the the cast like for Lance's campaign. You know, Lance himself, the cast for Lance's campaign. So that's Arvin, KL, um, and Sarah, and also you know like uh like JP is um has other priorities right now too like uh, he's focusing on family because he has twins um and yeah like i've got a new job that makes it makes my artist like super unwieldy so we will be yeah we'll be this is the i'll be streaming when i can until the end of the month um yeah dice cast will be shutting down um uh, but i will be streaming on my channel like uh, my own i guess my own stuff like i play other games than RPGs, uh, I feel like. Um, also, I got into Dicecast as like a uh, even though I, I, I kind of, I kind of weighed my choices. Like, do I continue streaming on Dicecast or not? Because um, they do plan to continue streaming, uh, but I felt like I get, I went to the Dicecast like really with one objective, which is to help a friend, help JP, uh, come out with a. A quality like um, quality product so I, I, I volunteered to help with audio and then eventually you know like started playing on stream also and so I think started eventually like putting up our own content together and like my own content on Dicecast um, but like if you know with JP also pulling out like I don't feel like I wanna you know it's this is his baby and we'll keep it that way essentially um, my channel is uh, yeah, um, Mark Lobster. So I give me some time to set it up. Like, but uh, I'll 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 stream on Dicecast until the end of January, mostly because I do want to thank like all of you uh, who've been you know who've been who've stayed with us throughout um, um, the time that we've been doing Dicecast this whole time. Um, th those of you who stuck with us, uh, thank you so much. Um, Lots of th we wouldn't have done this like we we wouldn't have kept this going as uh, long as it did like without you guys you know um, it is always like something to look forward to every week where we would talk about ta tabletop news and stuff or even do uh, RPG gaming uh, thank you so much thank you and I'll keep streaming here until the end of January when I can and then February I will be uh, setting up you know dusting off my old Twitch channel that's uh, Mark Lobster. So, yeah, um, I guess I'll put together like a more formal announcement uh, about that. JP also streams, I think, from time to time on his own Twitch. That's uh, Riveus. Uh, but yeah, we'll put we'll put up info on the Dicecast um, socials and on stream as well. But yeah, I just wanted to make that announcement uh, before heading out today. So yeah, thank you. Oh, thanks for the follow. Um, yeah. Um, I'll, on my channel, like it will be, I, I'll still talk about what I'm doing with tabletop RPGs, what I'm doing, and like the video games I'm playing. Um, yeah, it's it's bittersweet, I know. Um, thank you for you know sympathizing, Santa Goy. But yeah, hopefully we'll still see each other online. Um, if not here, then yeah, on my channel. Uh, also, when JP has, yeah, like, JP and I will still find time. To play games together and we'll probably stream on um hopefully like we can find time to stream on both our channels together um from time to time but yeah not as dice cast so thank you again for following dice cast for supporting this channel uh while it lasted uh we learned a lot i learned a lot doing doing this and it's the experience has been invaluable um now i look forward to maybe helping out other you know other people other organizations locally about tabletop games and more like who want to stream um help out especially with audio and stuff um yeah that's it thank you for tuning in today uh hopefully you had fun chatting see you guys around uh yeah uh bye thank you